In this lecture segment, we consider American art in the 1970s, with a focus on process art, performance art, feminist art, and land art. The 1970s is a time of pluralism with great diversity in the production of art, as you see in these two examples, and lots of different branches and types of work being created. It's often called post-minimalism, which begins in the 1960s and extends into the 1970s, art made after minimalism that reacts to it. Many artists moved away from the minimalist aesthetic and the resistance of minimalism to tell stories, express emotion, and connect with the human condition. Artists returned to the human body as subject and object in the 1970s, having learned their lessons from minimalism about using industrial materials and putting works of art in viewers' direct space. We also see works of art that move art outside of the gallery or museum space, and that continue the 20th century theme of challenging the definition of art and changing the nature of the art object. Eva Hesse was born in Germany to a Jewish family and immigrated to the U.S. as a child. She went to art school and Yale University and was friends with many minimalist artists. As a sculptor, she responds to minimalism, but uses her sculptures to express movement and emotion. Her works have more texture than minimalism and often take the pristine forms of minimalistic objects and make them tactile. Her work is part of post-minimalism, but is also categorized as process art, a type of art in which the process of making the art is stressed, and often involves new means of production, like using gravity through dropping or hanging media. Works are often organic and employ non-traditional materials like cloth, wire, and wax. In this example, she uses factory-made materials, plastic tubing, rope, and wire, similar to the industrial materials we saw minimalists using, but she also uses paper mache, paint, and cloth. She responds to the stacked grid forms that Donald Judd was making around the same time, creating a series of cubes extending vertically. But instead of leaving the edges hard and crisp like a minimalistic object, she softens it with these vine-like forms that link the cubes and enliven the sculpture. She's actually responding to art history, using these unusual materials and a post-minimalistic visual vocabulary to create her take on the torsion and intensity of the Lyoko Wan, which she learned about in the art history classes she took, and then saw in Rome in 1965. The vines are snakes writhing about, made of cloth-wrapped wire that was then painted. She's adapted what she saw in minimalism to create a dynamic work with varied textures, but rejects the machine-made quality of minimalism for a more hands-intensive approach to art making, accommodating for gravity in her designs. We see other artists respond to, responding to art history as well, especially feminist artists who use their work to reveal the pervasive sexism of art history. Photographer Cindy Sherman began as a painter and then segued to photography and has been using her own body as her subject for decades to help viewers question how they think about women's bodies and their roles. We've seen the depiction of the female body many times in this class, and it's one of the most common subjects in Western art. Sherman shrewdly capitalizes on its place in art history and its repetition in mass media to reveal how context affects our understanding of women. In this example from her film Still series, she casts herself as a housewife with the clothing and the setting, as if it is a still from a movie. She plays a character, a living stereotype. She denies that this is a self-portrait. She says she does not see herself in the image, but instead becomes someone else. She controls her image. You can see the cable that allows her to manage the shutter of the camera and to take her own image, her own likeness, instead of having it be controlled by a male artist as it had been for so much of Western art history. She also subverts the normal power structure of an image of a woman, images which were historically made with the male viewer in mind, by men, for men, but here it is by her and she consciously shows her control of her image. The viewer can craft their own narrative about what is happening in the scene, perhaps helping them think about their biases and beliefs about gender and people. She dismantles and deconstructs art historical imagery, creating images that destabilize and complicate the traditional art history narrative. Sherman now has her own Instagram account where she posts warped selfies, and it's hard to find pictures of the real her and to separate the characters from the artist. Bruce Nauman uses his image to engage with art history and to document his actions as an artist in his varied long career. And one of the concepts that interested him was thinking about the artist as a fountain. 
1966 example from early in his career is one of a series of photographs he made related to puns. It's wordy art. He transforms language into image. The photograph shows him as a fountain, squirting water from his mouth, referencing Duchamp's fountain. He engages with art history to prompt the viewer to ask questions about what he's doing and what it means and what art is. Like we saw with Kossuth's One and Three Chairs, Nauman sparks discussion in our brains about the nature of art and the art object. So it's conceptual art, it's performance art documenting an artist's action, and it's slippery in meaning. Anna Mendieta similarly uses her body as subject, but instead of doing so in painting or photography, she does so in performance and earth or body art. She immigrated to the U.S. from Cuba as a child and studied painting at the University of Iowa, branching out into other arenas of art production. She began working in performance art, creating temporary works of art in which an artist performs some sort of action that is documented in video or using photos. She responds to violence and sexual violence in her Body Tracks series, with early versions showing her running her hands purposefully through red paint mixed with animal blood as she creates a track or path through the pigment. This is an example of performance art, a live action that viewers can observe. We see one of the still photos taken during the event. This is an extension of the performance art we talked about with Dada and Futurism, and the emphasis on process and the artist's actions that we saw in action painting with Pollock. She also used her form in her silhouette series. These were semi-private performance pieces in which she employed her body to create earth and body art in the landscape of Mexico and Iowa. We see here a photograph documenting one performance in which she had herself covered in flowers in a space resembling a womb, and in this one she covered her body in mud and placed herself in front of a tree as she becomes part of the tree of life. She talks about how she wanted to create a dialogue between her body and the landscape and unite her body with the earth. She often refers to the thematic links between women's bodies and fertility and creation, and to her having gone through trauma as a child and feeling displaced from the country of her birth. The Silhouette series has overtones of spirituality and connection to female divinity through the earth and creation. These works of art are decentralized, disconnected from galleries or museums, continuing to question the definition of art and the power structure inherent in both art history and the contemporary art world. Mendieta's Earth Body Works lead into our discussion of works of art completely removed from the context of art galleries, which had become a major force in the art world. In land art and environmental art, we see artists using the environment as a medium, creating art out of the earth or earthworks, or creating sculptural structures within a landscape like the sun tun tunnels which you see here. They challenge the definition of sculpture using impermanent or non-art materials. They are captured in photographs, but by the nature of land or environmental art, they are part of the environment and so change according to nature, wind, rain, and sunlight, degrading and changing them. Land art is also removed from the gallery system for showing art. They are often in remote locations and must be experienced on site. They are site-specific works of art, designed for and installed in specific locations. Like minimalism, works of land art are designed to create an experience for a viewer in a particular space with a work of art. They are also an extension of performance art, as many are ephemeral and they are hard to document and especially hard to sell. Robert Smithson was from New Jersey and moved to New York at the end of high school. He wanted to push the boundaries of art and stretch the art world. In an interview in 1969, he said, the major issue now in art is what are the boundaries? For too long, artists have taken the canvas and stretchers as given the limits. He began creating what he called non-site sculptures using stuff from the world, concrete, stone, and showing them in galleries, trying to eliminate the boundary between trash and treasure, interior and exterior. His spiral jetty is the most well-known work of land art in the world. In his sketches of the design, we see a simple spiral extending from the shore of the Great Salt Lake in Utah out into the water. He intended that the spiral would reference primordial life like a fossilized ammonite. Smithson directed a crew in creating the work out of materials found on site at the Great Salt Lake, displacing earth and black basalt rock using heavy equipment to produce the 1,500 foot long, 15 foot wide spiral extending into the inland saltwater lake. It's in a pretty remote location, and visiting it is a pilgrimage. Visitors can walk on it, but the ground is crusty with salt. 
Smithson intended for the visitor to experience the site and feel the shifting sensations of walking the spiral into the lake, as he did in the movie he produced about the project. When it was first built, the spiral jetty was above the water level, but it was covered by water within a couple of years and remained so for decades, peaking above the water in times of drought. Smithson wanted the work to change constantly, to be at the whim of nature, to respond to the fluctuations of seasons and the earth. He wanted the work to embody entropy, that change is constant, and that order inevitably falls into disorder. This is a work of art that exists outside of the gallery system. In museums, we control light, humidity, and human contact to try and preserve works of art, to slow their aging, their degradation. But Smithson created the antithesis to this pervasive and powerful compulsion to preserve art and produced instead a work of art intended to change and evolve. Many of the works of art from the 1970s present intriguing challenges for museums and institutions today. When an Eva Hesse sculpture is falling apart because the material is decaying, what should a museum or collector do? In the case of the Spiral Jetty, the institution responsible for it today decided to let it change as nature wills, but to document those changes. The 1970s continued to complicate the definition of art and to decentralize the showing of art as artists use new materials and engage in new contexts in their production.